Hi, everybody. Welcome to men, huh? How exciting is this to have the queen of the killer brownie amongst us? Um, how many of you guys have had a killer brownie? Yes, most of us, right? I'm a huge fangirl, so this is an absolute privilege and honor to be talking to Shemen today and hearing all about her story of the killer brownie. So for those of us who have not had a killer brownie, we, there will be an opportunity to taste them <laughs> later today. But Shemen, in your words, why don't you tell us about what a killer brownie is? Well, if we start with the product, um, great photo. <laughs> What originally is, was known as the Killer Brownie was a single recipe of a brownie that was different than anything else that had been tried at that time, because people, when they thought of brownies, thought of what we bake at home. So this had a different texture than anything other, uh, that had ever been done like it. There's about 25% caramel in the middle, perfectly layered, as you can see, from the side. And it was just really something different and innovative that no one had really seen at that time. Um, so it kind of started to take on a life of its own. So the brownie at that time was that single flavor, and then we, DLM at that time, which owned the brand, went on to make several flavors and several varieties of the product. My dad in 1988 actually trademarked the name. And the product itself was kind of an innovative concept with a couple of other retailers, like-minded, like my dad, looking for ways to kind of do different things that would bring people into the store other than what they had, most people thought of that a grocery store would offer. Um, so, but anyway, it went on to have several different flavors. In 1988, we trademarked the name. In 2000, my dad created a separate wholesale business, which I know we're going to talk about that later, and um, because there were so many people interested in buying it at that point. So, but that's the product and kind of the innovative start of what we see today. That's amazing, and you do do incredible flavors. I had the pumpkin one just the other day. Yeah. It's like when I see that they come out, I run over there and get them, so it's totally working. <laughs> um, okay, so what do you think makes it so special? Like, again, it was just like nothing else that had ever been experienced before. And at that time, too, again, they were looking for more innovative ways to bring people into the store. Um, more and more people were buying, starting to buy from the grocery store as opposed to baking at home. So, and more and more families were all working, so they were looking for a treat that they weren't necessarily um, baking at home. And what really kind of made it take off was... Also at that time, a new concept was box lunches. So DLM put the killer brownie, the original killer brownie, into their box lunch. And then all of a sudden, all of Dayton that knew what a killer brownie was because it was this unique dessert inside of a new concept, which was a delivered lunch. So um, kind of that's... Love that. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so how did, how did it come to be? Like it was invented in the kitchens at DLM, is that right? It was a collaboration with my dad and a, a, another retailer actually in Northern Ohio. Okay. And um, again, just we've actually stayed true to the original recipe. Um, and a lot of different things happened over time. You know, there was, they shared the recipe at one point, not a good idea because people didn't create it the exact same way. But um, yes, it was started in the tiny little, well, if you go to the Oakwood store now, that whole front area where the bakery is is actually bigger than it used to be. It's just a tiny little closet of a bakery, and I actually think they were baked in the basement originally when it was very first started. Very yeah. cool. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Dorothy Lane Market and your connection to, to with this very special place. <laughs> so um, my grandfather actually started... Dorothy Lane Market in 1948. And everyone says, who's Dorothy? Well, I mean, if you live here locally, you know there's Dorothy Lane Avenue. <laughs> so, there, and the market was on Dorothy Lane. And before that, he actually had a fruit stand. And the concept of a supermarket was new. Before that, you went to the butcher shop, the fruit stand, the bakery. It wasn't all under one roof. But so he was like way ahead of his time. He actually traveled all around the world to share kind of the supermarket experience. Um, in the 1950s. So that's where it all started. And then my father, my grandfather got sick in the early, early 1970s. And so my dad actually took over the business. He was in his early 20s and had five little kids. Um, he's still the CEO today, semi-retired. But if you know my dad, <laughs> he'll never retire. Um, and then my brother is the chief operating officer today. And they both act as, because Killer Brownie is a separate financial wholesale entity owned by the same family, a little bit different structure. So my dad and my brother now today act as kind of board of directors over Killer Brownie, and then I'm president. So that kind of is all the tie-in to the family. And I'm third generation, and my daughter actually works in marketing department at, at Dorothy Lane Market, so we have a fourth generation. So what yeah. was that like growing up in that, that sort of family business? Um, well, one thing I learned from a very young age is that if you want to run a business, you have to work hard. 
Um, my dad worked a lot, and we all worked. From the time I was like 13, I mean, we were we worked in the stores. We swept the basement. My dad likes to say everyone had to sweep the basement. I don't really know why we, <laughs> the kids had to sweep the basement, but I felt like we were always there working. And it's funny, even now, I go in the back, I go in the produce department or the back room of the produce department, and it takes me back to when I was like eight years old because that very distinct smell of cutting fruit just brings back all these childhood memories. But we were always at the store. We were always doing stuff. Years ago, we used to give away, um, we did, had an anniversary sale every August, and all the kids gave away entry blanks. I was like 13 when I started doing that. So I would say one of the other things about not only growing up DLM but in an entrepreneurial home is you, we talked about it at home. And I always knew that that was something special. And I highly encourage people to, if you're thinking about starting a business or growing a business, include your family um, because it's exciting for them. I always felt as a kid that I was really proud of what my family was part of. You know, I can remember saying, my dad owns Dorothy Market, because I just thought it was the <laughs> coolest thing as a kid. You know, you just, and it, he worked so hard, and that really taught me that if we want to do something special, you have to be willing to put the time in. You have to be willing to work. Yeah, mm -hmm. that ties into, I don't know if it, many of you are here at, for watching the movie premiere that opened, but she, um, Sarah Kyle talked about mm -hmm. demonstrating for your kids, you know, like showing that sort of entrepreneurial spirit, because it does, it stays with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so how would you say that this impacted you? Do you think that this has had an influence in the leadership role that you now have with Killer Brownies? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it really taught me some of those very basic things about business and um, how to grow our business and the importance of people. That was always so important to my dad. Um, so it, it really kind of, do you want me to share my leadership style? I know you're Go Is ahead, this the go time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you go ahead. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> no, go. Go, go ahead. Um, well, I, I think one of the things that I learned from my dad is probably one of the most important things is to care about the people that are working for you. And I would think that I think that that was always so important to me. Like, if you take care of the people, whether it's one person or 100 people or 1,000 people, but if you take care of the people in your care, they will take care of your business and help you grow it. And that was something very important I learned from my dad. Do you, did he say that explicitly, or was it something you observed? Or how do you think that lesson came through? Well, I remember him saying, your number one customer is your employee. So, and that always stuck with me. That's amazing. Very cool. Um, OK, so Killer Brownie, uh, let, let's uh, flip through it. We got a couple cool pictures here, I think, of the Ganesh. There we go. OK, so this is the fam, right? This is, this is the fam. OK. Yeah. And so like, ladies what, hair and all. It, yeah. What are you guys doing here? What is this all about? This picture is actually, uh, my dad took us to a trade show, the Food Marketing Institute. And I remember it was like two stories high. It was at McCormick Center in Chicago. And um, I think I was like maybe 17 or 18 in that picture. And I just remember being really overwhelmed and impressed with all of the, st like all the booths. They were huge and just how big and massive it was and just how big the industry was outside of Dayton, lear really learning what the industry was all about. So he took you to trade shows at 17 or 18, like you were just barely out of high school or you were in high yeah, school? Yeah, so all of us, we all went to this trade show. Right? That was actually my four siblings, a couple of spouses, and my mom there in the middle. Yeah, That's amazing. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay, so let's see if I can get that to click again. Can you advance it? Do you mind? Okay, so then we move on, and Killer Brownie becomes its own company out and spins out of DLM, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that process and how that opportunity came to be? So, in like I said, my dad had trademarked the name. That was in 1988, and that was really just about my dad was. He's done that with several things, honey baked or a honey baked that he would die. It's <laughs> heavenly ham, but it was a honey baked ham. Um, but that was a trademark name as well. So he was smart to know that, like there so could be some importance in this trademark, and there were some other phrases that they actually trademarked as well. So he did that not really knowing what the future would be with the name of the brand. And then in, along the way, a lot of other like-minded retailers wanted to be able to carry the product. And so they formulated a wholesale business to just kind of be able to create that as a separate financial, really, transaction. Um, again, not really knowing what, what that would be. But then from 2000 to about 2008, um, there was a little bit of the manufacturing in the bakeries at DLM, and then there was actually a time where an outside manufacturer made the brownies for um, us because it got too big for them to be handled at that time. 
And then in 2008, they actually brought it back and used a space in the back of Washington Square. It was like a 3,000 square foot bakery and it was just the Killer Brownie Bakery. Again, separate name. Um, Killer Brownie Distributing was the name of the company at that point. A, d a different ownership, et cetera. But still family owned. So it was till, 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 oh my goodness, till 2008. As a family, we always talked a lot about the potential of Killer Brownie, like everyone loved this product, but the big question with a brand is can it live on its own? And it was always so tied to DLM up until that time, so, but we felt like we had something special because it had created a special niche here and why couldn't that become truly national? And there were other people in other parts of the country that knew my dad that were retailers that they were excited about it too. And I would just say, like I've read recently, and I think it's so true, in tr truly grow a business, you have to have two things. One is that you've got to have something that meets a need or is different or unique. And the second it, part of that is it has to matter to enough people. So we already knew that it was something really special, but would it matter to enough people? Would, it, would we be able to really grow it beyond what people had known in the Dayton, Ohio area connected to the DLM brand? So in 2013, which was really a pivotal moment, it was actually kind of my idea. I sat with my dad and my brother and I said, I think I could, because I had done some um, other sales. So I did not work in the family company for about 25 years. I was actually a registered nurse. And then I had also done some other side entrepreneur business because I, that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. So I went to my dad and I said, I think that maybe I could be like a dedicated salesperson for Killer Brownie and really saw a vision for what it could be. And so that really was the first time we had a dedicated salesperson. So I was hired and left my nursing career in 2013 and was just chief customer officer, just took care. I called on all the wholesalers, or all the wholesale companies, or all the accounts, all the retailers. And really, one of the very first things that I did was I wrote a plan, a strategic plan about where I thought we would be in five years and exactly how I wanted to get there. Um, or exactly where I knew we would get, but I wasn't 100% sure how, but I knew what, what we could do. So that's how the business really started to take off. And it was really, again, very important for me in 2013 when we were starting to build this, that people would understand that it was gonna live on its own. That it wasn't, I wasn't out as a representative of Dorothy Lane Market. Obviously it's near and dear to my heart, but that was not, people outside, you know, in California or, or in other areas of the country didn't really know the DLM brand. I needed to help them learn and know what the Killer Brownie brand was. And so it was really important and very important today for people to understand the difference between the two, as beloved as, as it is in Dayton, the two together. Um, so that's kind of where what started to take off. That's awesome. So w when you were like starting to realize that you're doing other things and you're being called to this Killer Brownie mm -hmm. opportunity, like what was that calling? Like, or, I mean, how did you know that this was what, that you wanted to go pitch your dad on this? <laughs> Well, I think because we had all, as a family, like, you know, at dinners as a family, you know, I think Killer Brownie could be something special. We just all talked about it. There was, it was so beloved. But how, and, you know, you think about other items or other passion brands, and there's actually a book called Passion Brands, when people are so passionate about a brand, it, it has the potential. Why is it touching people's hearts? Why are people drawn to that? What is the connection? So I, I think that, it wasn't necessarily a new concept or idea that I would be just doing that dedicated sales. I think it was kind of a, now we're ready as a family to take this next step. So did he agree right away when you pitched him? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, but nervous, you know, because uh -huh. it was different. Um, but yeah, I mean, I shout out to my dad because without his support, we wouldn't be where we are today. So he Very has cool. always, always supported it. Um, okay, so in that, you mentioned you wrote that strategic plan. Like what was in it and how did you get going? So um, in that, at that time I knew where I wanted sales to be. So I wrote down what a sales number would be and I knew how far reaching I would want it, our company to be and I kind of like spaced it out over five years. But this is where we're gonna go in five years. And I will say when I first started, um, really did not know what I was doing because I didn't know that side of the industry very well so I made a ton of mistakes but I inserted myself into everything about the business that I could learn. In meetings, I took a lot of notes. I listened to the way buyers talked. I would go to meetings and say all the wrong things. 
and that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I knew there was potential there. So I had this, but I kept thinking in my mind, I'm going to get reach these customers. I'm going to reach these customers. So that was 2013. Um, one of the first things that we did, and I'll talk about this more about branding, is I knew that we needed to kind of change our business structure a little bit. The way my dad had the business structure before um, was more like franchise. And so we changed to a traditional model because I was like, this, I need to be able to just sell this straight out. So we did that. We changed the business model so it would be a little bit easier. Um, and then we'll talk about branding here a little bit. But there were some other things that we did along the way. So we had that 3,000 square foot face, space. And then as we started to grow, we built a new warehouse. Kind of if you drive back where Washington Square is in the back, it looks like a big um, just a big warehouse, mm -hmm. and that was the Killer Brownie expansion. That space was 7,000 square foot feet, and I remember walking through it being like, oh, I'm never gonna be able to sell enough brownies to fit in here, and that was in, we moved in 2016, and by 2017, we were talking about a bigger space. Wow. So we were um, expanding, and one of the big things that really was pivotal was we um, attended our very first trade show in 2017, and then every Literally every national brand came to our booth, a little tiny 10-foot booth, and I, don't, I think maybe you even have a picture of it, but I don't remember yeah. if it was in there. Am I flipping? Can we flip? Might not, but oh, there, there you go. There it is. That was it. Yep. So it, that little space was 10 feet by 10 feet, and literally every major retailer in the country came by, and they were all excited about what we were doing. So that was that year. And that same year, we also became food safety certified, which you have to be if you want to be able to, to sell the product on a national basis. So those were two really big pivotal things that we knew we had to do in order to really grow. So um, seeing what all the interest was, we were, I mean, at that point, so from the time we had dedicated sales until 2017, I would say the business grew probably about six or seven times. Wow. Um, and then 20. 18, 2019, we did some things with branding, which I'll talk about in a second. But I mean, where we are today from the very first year is about the business has grown over 20 times. That's and amazing. Where we are right now in comparison to last year, we're up 100% in sales. I actually don't recommend that. It's very <laughs> <laughs> stressful, but from a year ago. Um, and then prior to that, we grew 50% over the year before that. During the pandemic, we still grew 50%, and we had some very rocky times when it all first hit. Sure. Um, but it had been really tremendous growth. Along the way, I always had a strategy and a plan. It doesn't happen by accident, for sure, but that's kind of what has happened to the trajectory of Killer Brownie. What do you attribute that to? Like, what, what's, what do you think is working so well? Is it just that the word is getting out, or is it specific marketing? Is it your beautiful photography? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, I will tell you, I think it's the, uh, really what we did with the brand. So the brand originally, well, I think we'll that kind yeah, of answers Do you mind flipping? Can we see that? Yeah, we want, we'll see the, oh, other way. Uh, oh, okay. we'll, we'll come I'll back talk to about this. that in a second. Yeah. yeah. So well, I'm not oh, sure. You can kind of see some of the sorry, old pictures. Going. Go forward, please. We'll look at that. We want to see the old. Keep going. That's it. Well, keep oh, going. the old, old logo. Keep going. There we oh, go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so this is. The old brand. So, yes. So the original brand was, um, my dad drew that on a piece of paper. <laughs> you can still see that neon sign in the back of uh, the Oakwood store. And I actually think, I actually think all the stores still have that sign. But, and, and so that was what the look of the brand was. And it really, again, was tied to DLM. And then when I first came, I think like 2014, I was like, I think we need an updated look. And my dad was like, no, I drew that. <laughs> and then we had an updated look, and I did not know what I was doing. I thought it was all about colors, and so we updated it. But then in 2019, and early in the year, I knew we needed to change the look, but I will say what was so pivotal about that year is I really, and this is something really important for people to understand, is that a brand is not just about your colors and the logo and the way it looks. A brand is who you are. And so I knew the, that if we were going to change what this looked like, well, I really had to dig deep and redefine who we were as a company. So some really big things happened that year. Um, Jessica, our editing our marketing director, at that time she was working at DLM, and she and I did a, like a three-day power branding session at my house, like sticky notes everywhere. It was like this emotional rebirth of a brand because you just step back and start with your why. Why am I even doing this? Who am I trying to impact? 
And it really became super defined and clear to me at that point that this was about the people that were on the journey with us, which is the people that worked at Killer Brownie. And that, um, so we really started telling that story. And then we also made a couple other the decisions that year while um, hiring a marketing director, which I can talk about that later too. But uh, we made the decision to change the name of our company to the Killer Brownie Company and to focus on just making brownies. We pretty much were already doing that anyway, but a lot of people don't realize that, yes, we make that triple layer brownie that you all try, but we have probably 30 recipes and 90 SKUs. So we make oh, that signature type of product, and then we make brownies like a brookie, which doesn't have any caramel in it, has um, a brownie cookie combination, butterscotch, all kinds of fun and interesting flavors, and then we do regular brownies as well on a wholesale basis. But we decided we're not going to make cookies. We're not going to make cake. We actually tried making... Um, uh, like breakfast bars and also coffee cakes. Super good, not scalable. So we decided we are going to be the only company really in the United States, probably in the world, that wholesales at this level that only makes brownies. There's no other wholesale bakery that just makes brownies. There's bakeries that make brownies, but they also make cookies, pies, everything else. So we thought if we could corner this edge on the market and become recognized as specialists. So we changed our name decided that that was our focus strategy, and that's really what took Can off. Can you flip to the next one? We'll look at the new logo, right? There it is. Yeah. Look how beautiful. So, yeah. yeah. So the result of all that emotion and definition and all that was the beautiful new logo, um, and also our tagline, Specializing in Joy, um, and credit to Jessica and her creativity um, for coming up with that. But it really, I would say it was an emotional change for us, too, because of all those other things that we talked about. And the results of 2019 to today are the business has tripled since then, but it, just being focused and um, really knowing who we were. So, you know, I always kind of, it was really me up prior to that. You know, we had, we had probably, I mean, I think in 2017, we had like, I don't know, 10, 12 employees. We have over 100 now. And I was like sales, marketing, which I should never be in charge of marketing, because I don't know what I'm doing. But um, hiring someone smarter than me was probably the smartest thing in that area I ever did. But I, um, you know, I was just doing it all. And that's not scalable. I, I think that's one of the things I learned through this journey is that you have to, you have to hire really smart people or involve really smart people that know what they're doing and then trust them and, and invest in them. Invest not only in them, but invest in their ideas as well. Um, another really big thing we did in 2019 is we hired a dedicated national salesperson. And that was a really big deal because that was my baby for six years. And it was a person I trusted and had worked with because he was one of our customers. Um, but that was a big deal, letting go. And letting go is really where you see true growth happen. That's amazing. So it's clear that people are important to you. Very. You've said this. I've worked, <laughs> yeah. We've heard this theme again and again. And I'm going to... Um, Shemen doesn't know that we're gonna do this, but we're gonna flip to the last slide. Because um, her people actually, we gave them the opportunity to say a few <laughs> words about Shemen for this event. And I mean. I should have been warned about this and brought tissues. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is really incredible as, as an entrepreneur. Oh, can we? <laughs> um, I have some of the, some of the notes here. Um, I mean, because at the end of the day, right, when you're building a business, so much of it is about the people, and you're the leader of, these, of, this, of this organization, of this team, and the things that, can we pull it back up? <laughs> okay. Um, the things that they say about you here are just amazing. She's got a passion for people. It says, nurturing, protective, curious, decisive, grace under pressure, compassionate, and compassion and guidance that you give the team, and that you're an inspiration. And I really love this one from the director of sales, right? That is that Mark, um, her commitment to the success of the company and our people is relentless. She models and reinforces the four pillars of our culture every day, joy, love, tenacity, and creativity. Wow. It's unbelievable <laughs> what they have to say about you. Wow, that's, yeah, you should, did you, obviously you guys knew about this. Um, you know, that is probably the greatest gift anyone can, can give you, is that you could build something that touches other people's lives, that, that they embrace like that. Um, everyone that knows me knows I'm emotional, but it's just so the joy of my life. I mean, I think we, 
if, if you back up to when you're starting a product or, or you want to start a company or do something, and you know who you are, and it's always, every business in the world is just a bunch of people. But if you, if you care about people and you know why you're doing it and you give people an opportunity, I mean, I look at all these names here and I think about opportunities that our company has been able to give so many people, that's the greatest gift. That's the greatest thing. And if along the way you have this great product that people buy into and enjoy and love and get to experience with their family, I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. And I mean, I will tell you that I believe our brand is not only the color, the look, and the product, but it is who we are. Because people, we're now known in the industry for great customer service and that people know who our product directors are. They know how amazing our marketing is. They talk about us like that. And it's not about me, it's about all these people that have joined us along the journey and we're excited to be a part of it. And that's where I think you, you can truly build a legacy out of whatever that is. Right? It's, it can never be just about the product. It has to have those things that I talked about. You have to have a great product and enough people have to be excited about it. But then it's this becomes this platform for something that's so much bigger than just one person. That's amazing. So, so as a leader, how do you instill this culture like throughout the team? What's your... What's your secret to that? Um, so I, I think starting with the why, which I've mentioned before, and um, for us, we did a lot of exploration about what were our core values um, and really what is our mission and vision. Our purpose as a company is to nurture an environment where people can reach their fullest potential. That's our in internal purpose. Everyone knows that, we talk openly about it, and from that we built our core values. And our core values are not what most people expect. One of them is love, which people are like, seriously? <laughs> but it's because love is about coaching, training, helping, and guiding people. It's not just um, all the easy stuff, it's sometimes the hard stuff too. So it's love, it's creativity, and that, if you grow a business 20 times in six years, you better be creative. No kidding. <laughs> because a whole bunch of stuff isn't gonna work, and it's not just being creative, but we say it's also accepting creative ideas. So it's, um, we talk openly about this every single day. We huddle every single day. We highlight one of our core values. Um, tenacity, which again, if you go a business 20 times over, you have to be tenacious. Um, and joy. We, it's joy even when you're having a bad day. Am I really truly enjoying what I'm doing? Am I providing an environment where people can have joy? And we live those values not just in word, but we, we utilize them in a lot of different ways. We have a recognition program for our team called Brownie Points where they recognize each other. They all talk about our core values. Um, that's a very important that we're not just recognizing them, but that they recognize each other. Recognition is the number one underrated thing in humanity, like we just, and in a business. And it's super important that people are given the opportunity to be thanked and appreciated by their teammates. I love so that. we do that um, very intentionally. And then we also, so that builds our, we really lay the foundation even when we're recruiting and when we're interviewing about who we are. We have people read our core values and if it doesn't relate to them or if they don't, if they don't get excited about any of them, they just might not be the right fit. Um, but we also find that a lot of our recruiting comes from referrals because people that work there, they'll tell their friends and family, you have to come work with us. And that's just the best testimony there can be that you would, that someone that works for you would want someone else to come and work, that they love, come and work for you. Um, so it's a very intentional though, I will say. We have a lot of internal programs, which I mean, someday we can talk about what all those things are to uh, protect our culture, but it's not gonna happen by accident because everybody says they want, everyone wants to work at a place where there's great culture and everyone wants to create one, but if you're not intentional about it, it's not gonna happen. Um, I would think another thing is we're super transparent. We share, and that really was started, my dad started a program where years ago, my dad and brother, we share, we do profit sharing with literally everyone as long as you've been there for 90 days. Um, and as long as we meet certain milestones, we share that with our team. That was the start of, from my dad, great game of business. But we also in that process share the financials with everyone. So they know right where we are and so that everyone has kind of a sense of ownership for what's happening. So how they can impact it. You know, if it's wasting ingredients or turning out the lights or sharing from the exciting things of, you know, sharing the product out with their friends or their family or um, just everyone feels like they're kind of part of that entrepreneurial journey with us together. It's so great. Okay, so spoiler alert, um, the business grows crazy. The brand is beautiful. 
but there were some hard days, I'm sure, as there are with every entrepreneurial journey. Um, Jay, can you flip back to um, a couple more? There we oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. tell us a little bit about some of the, the challenging moments along the way. Oh my goodness. You know, it's so funny. I look back at so many of these things. We were just looking through some old videos and I think, I can't believe the stuff we did. <laughs> I was just so sure in the moment, I'm gonna get past this or we're gonna get past this. So we've did a couple of things. Um, what this particular picture is, is we just determined that if in order to grow, we were gonna need to sell the product in the box we baked it in because a lot of customers wanted to buy it in what's called a food service or a bulk pack. And before that, we were baking in a metal pan and we would have to flip them out every morning. It was just this painful, horrible process of doing this like four to six o'clock in the morning, banging metal pans every morning. So we knew in order to scale, that was not gonna work, at least for us at that time. So switching over to these ovenable boxes presented several challenges. One, it's different heat conduction. So we had to, it was, a lot of test and about even just getting the um, temperature right and then the recipe on the oven. And then the other big part of it was the right kind of cardboard. So multiple times we worked with vendors that created cardboard that wasn't strong enough. So that's about, I don't know, a thousand dollars in brownies that spilled out in that oven. So it was just a totally disheartening feeling. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, that's not going to work. But the fix was corrugation needed to go a different way to be, reinforce it. So it, it's disheartening as it was. It wasn't like we thought, well, this is not going to work. A lot of people would say, that just doesn't work. We were like, no, it's going to work. We just don't know how. And so we kept going. And now today we bake in ovenable boxes. That's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. So it worked out in the it end. It worked out <laughs> yeah. in the end, yeah. Um, okay, so just, we'll end on a positive note. Can flip to any other screen. <laughs> Maybe maybe one more. There we go. Um, so for like, as far as you being a leader in this organization, um, like, what are some habits that you have, or or like your secrets to success that that you think have like contributed to your leadership abilities? Um, I well, personally, on a day to day basis, I like to get up early and kind of have calm, quiet time in the morning for planning reading, thinking, and sometimes I'll clean up my emails, but when I go into work for the day, I have to have mental clarity. So I, that prep time is important for me. Um, I try to exercise, I just try to do something for myself um, that kind of makes me feel kind of physically and emotionally ready to be able to be present for people. On days when I don't get that time or if I'm rushing or I'm late, I'm a different person. So I know that about myself, so it's really important for me to mentally prepare. So that's on a day-to-day. -day. Um, on kind of a bigger scale, I read a lot because I feel like the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so I'm usually reading. I mean, anyone that works with me knows I'm usually giving someone a book or a link. And Jessica and I are sh frequently sharing books and links with each other. Um, but I'm so inspired by what other people's journeys have been. I mean, there have been books that have been like, totally pivotal for me personally and in our business. So I highly, and some I can recommend too, like one, Scaling Up, highly recommend that book. Um, there's some just some great practical advice there. Anything from Simon Sinek, um, I love him. He's the start with your why. Right. I love him, all of his stuff. I actually heard him speak at a trade show and I was like, I love you and I'm gonna read everything you wrote. <laughs> um, but because it was just so, it's just so powerful. One of my favorite books of all time, if you're going to hire any people at all that everyone has to read, is a book by Bob Chapman called Everybody Matters. And he actually was the guy who's in, um, they own a huge international manufacturing of a bakery equipment, and like packaging equipment, but just this amazing human being that talks about the power of recognizing each individual as a human being, no matter how big your company is. Um, so some things like that drive, I mean, I could probably go on and on and on, but I'll tell you why reading is so important. I'll give you an example um, and why that's so important to me. Well, I'll get to the second. The other things that are really super important is writing strategy and communicating, all those things, being transparent. But there, right before the pandemic, um, actually Jessica gave me a book called Double Double. And there's all these chapters and they all really apply to us. And then there was a chapter about what to do in an economic downtime. I literally like skimmed it because we were like, Everything is great. <laughs> and you know, you don't realize how quickly the world can change. So the pandemic hit, and we had half a million dollars in orders cancel. And I was like, oh my goodness. And what I knew was, I'm not going to lay anybody off. We're going to get through this. This is temporary. So we kept making brownies, and we kept paying people, even though we really couldn't afford it. Because I was like, we'll get past this. If we, if we handle this right, everybody will be here with us when we get through it. So, but I thought, we've got to get out in front of this. So I went, I remembered that there was a chapter in that book about what to do in economic downtime. 
And I went back, I opened it, and I read it, and I got our director of sales and director of marketing, Jessica, and Mark on the phone. I was like, we need to talk about this. We need to have a book club, like, right now. <laughs> Do you remember that? Anyway. And, I, um, and in it, it said, do what doesn't seem like it would make sense. Invest in marketing, invest in sales. Get out in front of people. Put more money into marketing right now than you think makes sense. And I was like, okay, that's what we'll do. So we came up with a plan, and we invested probably more than, than at that time were, it was a little nerve-wracking. Sure. We invested in getting out in front of people, creating videos, doing some ads, and it just kept us in front of people. And we did one of the biggest programs that we'd ever done that year because we were able to get in front of a buyer for Sam's Club, actually. That's amazing. Um, ended up selling a couple million dollars wow. that so summer to them. But it was, but that book really, that's why I say you've got to open your up, yourself up to the information that's out there because everybody has done this before and there's a lot of great tips and tricks out there. There's no one secret, but it's all out there if you avail yourself to it. Love it, awesome. Do we have time for questions? Okay, we have a few minutes left where we can take questions if anybody has any questions for Shaman. Anybody? Oh, there we go. Up there. Is that Todd? All right. Always thought of it early on as very perishable. So actually, we shipped some to friends, and it didn't work out very well. Um, so I'm curious what I saw what you said about changing the way you bake. And so did you have to change the product itself? We the ingredients never, or preservatives or anything like that? No, there's no, there's no preservatives. Um, actually, in 2014, we took all the artificial ingredients out. So there, and we actually never really told anybody that because we were afraid people would tell, be able to, they would judge it differently and think it, it tasted different. But the current original killer brownie, now like some of the flavors that have some confetti and some of the sprinkles in them do have some artificial color. But there are six everyday flavors that have no bleached bromated flowers no um, high fructose corn syrup, no hydrogenated oils, um, all the bad stuff that you think of. So, um, but it's sustainably sourced cocoa. We did a lot of good positive things, but we didn't change the basic recipe. What you're thinking of is, is um, e-commerce and mail order, and that's all that business is done through Dorothy Lane Market. We actually don't do any direct to consumer. So all of our business is B2B, direct to wholesale, and the entire supply chain is frozen. So to answer your question, the product is baked and then it's frozen, and that preserves, that's the preservative, is the, is the freezer. So and then when it gets out to a retailer, they put it out, uh, and usually bakery shelf life is somewhere between three to five days for a standard product, but it's a great thing about sugar and butter. They're like natural preservatives, and they taste amazing. So our product has about seven to 10 days shelf life once it's put out in the bakery. So, so you're telling us it's healthy. Yes, it's super, it's a health food. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in growing the business, you said obviously you made a lot of mistakes. You kind of learned everything the hard way in growing both brand, marketing team, and all of that. What are one or two of the mistakes that you made that you wish you wouldn't have made and you can share with us in, in growing our businesses? That's a really good question. I'm going to say that I don't think any mistakes are ones that you shouldn't have made because you learn so much from them. So. And I, even advice, I don't know that I necessarily consider anything bad advice because you might get advice that doesn't, you're like, well, that doesn't apply to me, or, but that helps you define who you are. So some of those rough times, they make us stronger. It's really not about not making mistakes, it's about what you do with them and what you learn from them. We say, you know, fail fast, make a mistake, learn from it, get past it, and learn the next thing. What I would say is if you want to grow a business, know what you want to do and be prepared to make mistakes. One of the other great pieces of advice, we, um, I highly recommend Aileron. It's an organization here locally in Dayton. If you guys haven't heard of it, they're, built, um, they're an organization that supports entrepreneurs. And we actually had a coach, and we've done a lot of management training through their organization. And through one of our coaching sessions, our coach told us, think of this as the next best draft. And it's so, we say that and we repeat it in our business all the time because if you wait till something is perfect, 
you're like, I'm going to get, I'm going to do this, and it has to be perfect, or I'm going to make a mistake, and so I'm not going to do it till it's perfect. You never do it, and it's never going to be perfect. So the next best draft is just gives you permission to say, I've come as far as I can right now, and I'm going to take the next step in my business. I'm going to get it out there. I'm going to learn from it, and then I'm going to have a new draft of whatever that is. Um, so some of the mis mistakes or things that we did that did not work um, is, like I mentioned, we made products we probably shouldn't have. Um, our very first retail package was for Save a Lot, 1,200 locations. It didn't even have Killer Brownie on the label. It had it someone else's on the label, and we like. I don't. It was a really great product, but there's so much we did wrong. We spent a lot more money than we should have. I overordered. Let me tell you a mistake I made. We still, five years later, have about I don't know 300,000 containers that we never used. <laughs> that one day I'll find a buyer for. Um, but, you know, I didn't know that, that I needed to have all that in contract, like that they would have to buy the packaging if the program got discontinued or whatever that looks like. So you live and learn. But that did not make me not want to do retail packaging because I knew that's where the future was. And it did not make me feel like I didn't want to work or um, do a program as a private label. So it just made me feel like, okay, did, we did it, but we did it wrong. We're going to learn from it. We're going to do it again better. So that would be my advice, is, is don't be afraid of making the mistakes. That's where you learn how to do things even better. Hey, Schmidt, could you share some of the benefits of being a female entrepreneur and leader? Um, so I think there are a lot of benefits, um, more than disadvantages. I think because of being a, a woman, um, I think just you know having children and um, being a wife and I've kind of naturally been a nurturer, and so I think I just feel like that's kind of, I have sort of that familial feeling towards people that work in our company, and I worry about them and worry about um, their lives, and I think that that's an advantage because people want to know that they're cared about. And so I think, I also think, you know, that there's more, seems as though more opportunities than there used to be in this business. I've never really had any negative pushback or anything. I think just meeting other women that are doing what I'm doing, we tend to kind of have like this looking out for each other and supporting each other, and it's it's just always been a really positive thing. Um, so I, I would say overall it's been it's been an advantage as opposed to a disadvantage. Yeah, good question. Just as another woman um, doing bakery, do you have any advice for a small business trying to also get into business to business? Your food business, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I can speak a little bit more because I know more about food business, obviously. But I would say look around, and hopefully this is a practical piece of advice, but look around and see where some of the trade shows are, where you can get in front of some buyers. And it might be a show where you pay five hundred dollars. I mean, some of the big, huge trade shows are a few thousand, but they will even do some um, introductory specials for new brands, and they have whole sections for new brands. And what's the, nice about that is you're getting in front of people who are coming with the mindset to look for something new, and get it in their mouth. <laughs> you want them to try your product, and just like we were talking about the history with Killer Brownie, I mean, we knew it was something that was special. People tried it; it was a good experience. So now you've got that. And then to be able to tell, okay, why is this going to be important to all of your other customers? If you're trying to sell to another business, it's all about helping educate them about how they're going to be kind of the hero to their customers. You want them to be to feel like they're special because they brought this product in, and now they're going to share it with their customers. It's not nece just necessarily if they like it. It's let me t show you why all your other customers are going to think you great because you did this. <laughs> And then uh, the other thing, too, is listening, really learning to be a listener. In the sales process, we get so determined that um, this is what I want to say, this is what I want to do. And I always try to go into a sales opportunity and ask a ton of questions. For me personally, when I go out to visit a customer, I'll go to all their stores. I'll take pictures, and I get price points so I know what kind of conversation I'm going to have when I sit down with them. So learn as much as you can about your target audience, and it might not be the same from person to person. Um, because then they will feel like you you know who they are, and if you're again, if you're listening to them, and you might change your presentation a little or what you want to offer, and they will know it, and they'll be like, oh, she's listening. So just make sure that you're connecting with, and that you're not so focused on what you're trying to say or accomplish that you're not hearing what they need. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm coming around.
I don't know if I was the question in mind, but I definitely do have one. Um, Long-term Killer Brownie fan. My whole family loves them. We love Dorothy Lane. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know the Killer Brownie Co. just does brownies, but I know there's a section at DLM that does custom cakes, those cookies, those things that everything that the Killer Brownie Co. doesn't. I believe it's called Love Cakes. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any issues or friction distinguishing Love Cakes from the Killer Brownie Co. itself? Not at all. Yeah, those brands are all Dorothy Lane Market brands, um, and they're all made, pr probably 70% of what's sold at Dorothy Lane Market is made by their central commissary, their central bakery. So they have several pastry chefs, et cetera, there, and then they have an artisan bread program. So that brand is so strong. It's really, really, it's very different from what we do. So they're both strong within that space. And then outside, of course, of the Dayton market, it's we're a national brand, and those are more local. So, But it, it really hasn't at all. People, people love... One of my favorite things is Laura's cookies, and I do love cake. So <laughs> personally, I love all the other things that are in the bakery. So, they, But it hasn't been any, any competitive issue at all. Very, they're very cohesive. Good question. Okay, we'll take our last question right down the front way. It's all right. Just trying to get my steps in. <laughs> um, did you ever uh, have a big customer come who, you know, wanted... Made a, made a demand, per se, um, that, you know, went against your values. So, you know, for example, you know, a customer said, hey, we just, we can't freeze it, the product through the supply chain. We want you to put preservatives in it or, you know, something like that. Did you ever have that situation? And um, how did you, how did you navigate that negotiation um, in maybe an example where it went well, an example where it didn't go well? That is a really great question. Um, I, the answer is don't be afraid to say no. If you know who you are, then no is really easy. Uh, one of the largest companies in the country asked us to put preservatives in our product, and I said no. And it was not a problem for me because that was not aligned with our brand. And it would have been huge, huge business, but it was not worth it. That's not how I wanted people to meet Killer Brownie. I didn't want them to meet us with an artificial or preservatives or a... Um, a shelf life that was six months or a year sitting on a shelf. That's not what I wanted them to have. So it was an easy no for me. And the buyer actually said to me, well, if you ever change your mind, let me know. I said, well, I probably won't. So, yeah. 